All right, so I'm um, going to pick up with uh, open fractures. In the last section, um, we talked about uh, associated injuries, looking for uh, compartment syndrome, careful neurologic and neurovascular examinations, making sure you don't miss patients who drop their pulses, um, making sure uh, you don't uh, misdiagnose somebody just wiggling their fingers or wiggling their toes for an evolving neurologic problem that uh, you're not thoroughly diagnosing because you're only looking for minimal movements. Um, and uh, now we're going to move on to uh, open fractures. So open fractures essentially are uh, fractures that communicate with uh, you know the environment outside the body through a skin opening. Okay now um, obviously this example here is an open fracture uh, but uh, you know this is the extreme example. Uh, sometimes it's not so clear right you just have a patient with a fracture and then there's some abrasions on the leg and one of them actually is a little poke hole, just seems to be bleeding a little bit too much. Well, actually, that could be an open fracture, a type 1 open fracture, a poke hole, but uh, those things can be missed. I mean, this, this, this mess here, that's, that's obviously not going to be missed. Um, and the problem with open fractures are they are at risk for bone and soft tissue infection, right? So uh, important that, um, you know, you treat these properly to avoid these problems. They're at higher risk of associated neurovascular injury, certainly, you know, something like that, as you imagine, would be. Um, and the key to management is uh, early prompt antibiotics and surgical management to prevent infections. So um, you make the diagnosis, again, with a wound near the fracture site with persistent bleeding. Um, Maybe that sounds a little bit obvious, but uh, this is where it can be it can be uh, missed. And I say persistent bleeding because you think, well, any wound kind of persistently bleeds. Well, not really. I mean, if you have a small soft tissue wound and a poke hole in the skin, let's just say uh, let's just say this thing here is a uh, poke hole in the skin. Uh, it's going to bleed a little bit. Eventually, it's going to stop, right? But if if there was a fracture here and there was a poke hole there, well you may actually just see persistent bleeding because the bleeding is coming from the bone itself and the fracture sites will bleed and that's usually not going to just tamponade itself off right away. So it's a small point but it's really important and this is one of the things we look for to, to try to distinguish is something just a small wound or is it potentially communicate with the fracture site. Well the other thing you look for is air in the joint or in subcutaneous tissues on maybe an x-ray or CT scan. Right. So if you're not sure you know, it's thick soft tissue envelope, there's a small hole, you're not really sure if you see air in the joint and it's a distal femur fracture going into the joint, well then you have to think, geez, how did that air get down in there? Must have been some communication. That hole must have communicated down. Right? So the wound could be a poke hole or an open massive wound like in the last slide. And this is, this here is something in between. This is actually a, uh, this is the back of the heel, This is the, the toes out this way. They, uh, knee is way up in this direction. This is the back of the heel. This is actually an open uh, calcaneus uh, avulsion fracture, right, where the uh, fracture avulsed off of the calcaneus and tented and actually went through the skin. Here are some terms you probably should be familiar with. Uh, I think it is appropriate at the medical student level you sort of be you know, a little bit aware of some classifications and if there's anyone in trauma you should be aware of, it's probably this one. Uh, you know, the Castillo Anderson classification talks about you know the type one, two, and three open fractures, and those, these are sort of some typical examples. So the type one essentially when you have a small wound, poke hole perhaps uh, less than a centimeter, whereas a type two is usually a little bit more trauma. You mean you can see here how this is now you know uh, a little bit more complex fracture. I mean some people would even say that if you have a true segmental fracture, maybe it's a type 3, but we'll just say you know, maybe a little bit more of a severe fracture, but the, the, but the wound, right? So the wound is 1 to 10 centimeters. So these are still not massive, nasty, open fractures, but um, they're not just poke holes, right? So it's a real wound there, typically, you know, 3, 4 centimeters, something like that, especially for a tibia. Um, and then you have the type threes, right? So the type threes are big wounds, right? Like that last patient. I mean, maybe not that massive, but you know, ten centimeters, you know, and and, and more. So um, 
if all if, if that's all you have, then you have a type 3A, right? Uh, or if you just have you know bad fracture segmental with some soft tissue stripping, I mean that you may call that a type 3A. Whereas type 3B is a case that requires a flap, right? So some type of soft tissue coverage procedure. You know, you need to get plastic surgery involved, perhaps. Uh, so these are these are cases that are you know now we're jumping up into you know the type of cases that are much more prone for infection. You know, that's really what what we're worried about, and it's really what you see you know go up the ladder or increase in incidence as you go up the ladder, right? So you know the type ones here. Um, you know, pretty low incidence, like, you know, single digits uh, of infection. And, um, you know, as we kind of uh, get down to the type 3Bs and type 3Cs, uh, you have much higher incidences of infection. And type 3C is when you have a vascular injury requiring repair. So just because you have maybe the perineal artery injured in a, in a tibia fracture doesn't mean, uh, you know, and they say it doesn't need repair, then it's not a type 3C. So type 3C really means like the limb is completely at risk of limb loss. Um, so that just also increases the, you know, the ischemia, the potential for infection, etc. So open fractures, you know, management, you need to give immediate antibiotics. And this is, you know, easier said than done. If you don't pick up on the fact that the patient has an open fracture, you know, like a type 1 or a poke hole, you're probably not going to get antibiotics right away. Now, that said, the type 1 opens, fortunately, are the ones that don't get infected as, as easily anyway. Um, so maybe that helps, but um, certainly this is not a surgical maneuver. It doesn't require any specialty uh, uh, care. I mean, this is just recognizing and giving antibiotics. Um, so we do expect that that's something that should happen promptly. Um, it's important to reduce the fracture provisionally, irrigate the wound, splint, uh, and then do operative debridement, go to the OR, uh, debride the open fracture, stabilize it, and then possibly uh, those patients sometimes need additional debridement, antibiotic beads, plastic surgery flaps, etc. So what about musculoskeletal infection? Well, this certainly is tied in a little bit to the, um, to the last... Uh, a slide, you know, on, on open fractures because open fractures are more prone to infection. Um, you know, uh, th these are bad, okay? Um, and uh, it's a complication that's associated with trauma, it's associated with operative management of fractures. Um, certainly a case like this, uh, you can see here um, there's a chronically exposed steel plate here. You can see that the you know, the bone here is uh, you know, very yellow and sclerotic looking. Uh, you've got these sort of uh, cables that actually go completely around the bone and the plate and uh, they are causing some stripping perhaps there. Um, this does not look healthy. It's probably dead. Uh, and um, now you have probably bacteria on this. And of course now it's an open wound. The whole thing is colonized. So this is a, a disaster. Okay, and I cannot overemphasize that. Um, and just stepping back for a second, you know, infections also include cellulitis. Now, fortunately, those can be typically treated with antibiotics, but a deep infection, you know, down to bone, uh, you know, or at least a deep soft tissue infection require antibiotics and surgical management. So an abscess, something like this, they're operative uh, problems, and these are severely disabling, okay? Again, cannot emphasize that enough. Getting a uh, infected non-union or osteomyelitis of the bone, um, it is one of the most uh, you know, devastating uh, conditions a patient can really uh, have to go through because you're talking about months, years of treatment. Uh, people lose their jobs, lose their spouses, um, and um, often kind of go down a sort of downward spiral when these things happen if they don't have an excellent support network. So we are very paranoid about trying to prevent it from happening. So if it develops after a fracture is healed, um, then um, debridement, removal of implants, antibiotics uh, sometimes can be fine. You know, so the fracture is healed. You don't need an implant anymore. Um, get it out of there, clean it out. Hopefully that gets rid of the infection. Uh, 
and if not, you can go further. But if it develops before a fracture is healed, now you have a dilemma because um, fracture is not healed. You kind of need the implant to keep the fracture in place. You take it off, maybe it falls apart. Uh, and I'm not going to get too much into when you keep stuff, when you remove it. Like it's it's a very complicated subject, but um, certainly a situation like this can lead to, or even just present with basically what's called an infected non-union. Bone hasn't healed, and it's got pus and infection in it. Incredibly difficult problem to manage, and I'll just leave it at that. Chronic osteomyelitis is when you have, um, essentially, now you have dead bone, you have persistent draining sinus, perhaps, and chronic bone infection essentially is a surgical problem, right? Antibiotics alone are only going to suppress the drainage. Uh, any ID doctor will tell you that, uh, you know, the, the cure for this is really surgical debridement. That said, I mean, with aggressive treatment, cutting it out completely, adjuvant antibiotic therapy, you can cure people of chronic osteomyelitis, kind of like a cancer, right? So here's an example of a um, patient who has, uh, here's an AP, here's a lateral. On the lateral, you can see there's this fracture line here. Uh, you can see there's maybe some sclerotic bone, uh, persistent non-union. Uh, we'll just tell you this patient was also infected. Uh, so this patient has a uh, bone transport. Uh, they actually, you know, will cut out a section of bone. They have this tension. This is a circular external fixator. Remember I said a couple of lectures ago that uh, X fixes with the rings are very versatile, can be used for many different uh, um, treatments. Well, here's one. You cut out the bone. You do something called distraction osteogenesis. Once you've gotten rid of the infection, you now transport, grow new bone. So, um, most of this bone is new bone. You can see it looks different than everything else, and they basically grew that bone in the place of where all that infected bone was. It's pretty amazing. Um, but, uh, and, you know, it's a lot of treatment, but if you really want to get rid of an infection, that's one way to do it. All right, so um, we'll stop there, and we'll pick up with uh, pathologic fractures, osteoporosis, hip fractures, and stuff in the next talk. Thanks.